conversation on the power of the black vote, a blueprint for progressives everywhere. But first, uh, maybe because it's been a 10-day week uh, for me already, it's only Thursday, I'd like to invite us to take some deep and restorative breaths together for our collective nervous systems. I know that um, probably, uh, like me, you are reading things in your social media and in your news media that are shocking and that are, are a lot for all of us to handle. Um, so this is an opportunity, I think, for us to just have a, a, a brief, shared moment of grounding, restorative silence for all that we might be carrying with us in this conversation. So I'm going to close my eyes for five beats. Uh, feel free to join me. Um, and thank you. Thank you very much. Very short, repeated version of what I do in class. <laughs> and we do that for about five whole minutes, and it can be a little challenging for the students, but always an excellent learning experience. So, a brief reflection to get us started. Um, as I referenced, the pages of, of our news and social media are rife with harm of many kinds, local and global. And we witness these realities on a daily basis as we wrestle with them over our entire lives, even as we try to build a beloved community here in South Orange, Maplewood, and elsewhere. It seems to me that a central question for us in this moment of ongoing and unfolding historical harm, in whatever electoral cycle it might be, is this. How do we resist pessimism that threatens to fragment us? And how do we create the conditions of abundance that all of us need? including space for more joy, more creativity, more safety, love, and possibility. These are the kinds of questions that sit with me, sit in me, as we gather here tonight, and that motivate my work, my research, and my teaching. Luckily, our guests here each labor with some aspect of those questions from their particular point of view and their various lanes. We were going to start with Dr. Muhammad, but uh, since he was minus Shortly, I'm going to turn to Dr. Costly White. That was not what I Since he's not here, you get to go. Yes. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. White, uh, for your time this evening. This is going to be fun, Dr. White. Dr. Dr. Costly White. <laughs> <laughs> you all can guess why we both have the same last name. Right? <laughs> So uh, we have all witnessed the harm of uh, so-called post-racial politics and the backlash to the presidency of Barack Obama. Into this recent history is Kamala Harris's historic run for president of the United States. We know that this moment is both exciting and fraught. So the question to you to get us started, what are your thoughts about the political and cultural terrain that a black woman president will be stepping into? Not, not a big question at all. No. Um, um, and it's just, to, it's just to get us started. And, and uh, a sub question, because you know we have to be annoying as academics with our sub questions. <laughs> what can you imagine we must do to prepare for what will be a future backlash to uh, a President Harris's uh, uh, administration that might be similar to the political, cultural, and social upheavals that we witnessed after the election of our first uh, black president. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's you want really, to see, you want to it's like the easiest yeah. question I've ever okay. heard. <laughs>
figure out how we all can come together and make everyday life better for everybody around us. Um, okay, so the first thing that I, when I think about like her jumping into this presidency, the first thing I thought about was like, obviously Obama is our last reference for at least a black presidency, and um, he came in the midst of crisis. Um, not saying like Abraham Lincoln or FDR had it easy um, before, but like he jumped into the fire with the greatest recession since the Depression. The Great Depression, and I think what's fascinating to me um, is like, even though we look back, like right now, as we're in the midst of the backlash, or right, um, over the Obama presidency, we forget like when he was elected, we were like in the streets. Were y'all in the streets? Like when Philly, we were like running around, high five random white people, and, um, and like, like cheering. You know, like there was a moment in which we felt like there was a miracle. It was miraculous. Like America was something that we thought it, it wasn't, yes. and there was like this moment of possibility. And I kind of want to hold on to that in a way because that is also, I think, what Paris, her potential presidency, represents for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Is America be better than we think it could be, or it has been? Um, and so there's that. There's this like brightness of, of you know, like. You know, I, I always like to crumble everybody when I do my tea party talk, where I'm like, everybody's like, Obama will have a magical spell that will change race in America, right? But I mean, we have this feeling at least. Yes. Um, and then I think Paris is also being brought in in the midst of a crisis, but like they're like crises of silence. So that it's like a very different kind of thing, right? When it's economy or perceived as an economic recession, everybody wants to talk about it. When it's like an ongoing pandemic that is killing like still killing a thousand people a week, we don't talk about it, right? Or um, when it's what most scholars in the world are calling the ongoing genocide that our tax scholars are going to, like there's a silence around that. Um, and so I wonder, you know, I do think, despite our silence, both of those things are gonna occupy the presidency, actually. Um, you know, they're saying so far, like Social Security is seeing a huge um, swelling, at least people, people getting or receiving disability, um, but we are seeing like a huge percentage of people who are getting long COVID or disabled by it. So I think that those kinds of things will will manifest and also like even this week, this whole like now pagers are exploding and walkie talkies are exploding. This kind of cyber terrorism thing I think is gonna be a part of Harris's presidency actually. Um, and I, I, I can't imagine it staying isolated to the Middle East. A lot of times the things that we bring there have a way of traveling elsewhere. So I think that stuff is gonna pop up. Um, so I think one of the questions, and like Barbara, you tell me, because I know I've got this like five minutes. So okay. I want to make sure I don't go over. Okay. Um, one of the things that we've seen, so the question then is like, are we ready for a black woman presidency? One of the things we've seen over the last decade is around the world we've seen tons of, I should say tons, but we've seen women presidents in lots of places. India, Mexico, um, Ethiopia, Italy, Germany, like, you know, we've seen women leaders, South America, Peru, like, we've seen women leaders elected. We have a model now of what it really looks like. We've had it for, you know, years. I mean, go back to my natural blah, blah, blah. So I think, um, and we, like, poll people generally, depending on how you ask the question, people generally say they're ready for a woman president. And when I say generally, I'm like, at least 51%. Right? So it's not pushing us over, but the good news is like women tend to vote more, women support Harris more than men do. So like, you know, I think the polls in general are leaning towards her. So I mean, if you're talking about like electoral prospects, yeah, I, I could say America's ready for like anybody but Trump in certain ways, um, or at least like the number of people are. But I think for me, the question really is like, well, what does a black woman presidency mean for us? Like, for us as black people, for us as just people who are invested in this country. Um, and that, that in certain ways brings you back to Gaza, for example. Like, Gaza in certain ways was a black vote issue. Like, 60% of black Americans said they wanted a condition um, based on whether or not Israel was holding up uh, human rights and what they're doing in Gaza. Um, and Harris has just said, no, I'm not doing that, right? So there's like an engagement there with black voters and like what black voters want. Um, and I think about like Obama in certain ways when he was president. Y'all remember when there was like a kid that come to the White House at one point and he was killed or she was killed later on? 
And so Obama went to Chicago and he gave a speech. Um, and part of that speech was like about black parents and how they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? So it's like, it was just like a crazy speech. Like, you don't want to go to a funeral and like, <laughs> you know, talk bad about the people, somebody who just lost their daughter, for example, right? Um, you don't talk about it. So we have to, so I'm really wrestling with what Harris has had to do in this, you know, people are going to tap to the center, this idea of her appealing. So she's like, I'll put a Republican in my cabinet. Um, I don't care so much about fracking anymore. I don't support the Green New Deal. Um, and so I think, you know, there's there's that. And, and part of it is because she's up against um, what this scholar of Brooklyn Gibson calls weaponized misogyny, which is, like, misogyny was a term um, No, not Brittany. Uh, I'll think of that. Um, but she comes from that one person. But she uh, came up with it to really talk about the way that misogyny gets targeted towards black women in particular. Um, so you got to think about welfare policy, for example, the welfare queens. That is like a misogyny law trope, right? Like, Thank you, Thank um, you, And like, and and so we see a lot of that mobilized policy, and she's working against that in a certain way. And that is why she's performing as she is. So anyway, I'm wrestling with what her her election will mean, not just for her, but also like when we have this kind of identity and we have this investment in this identity, what does it mean that we can get out of it? And what can she do? And now we're in that space. And Khalil is here, so. Germany 
Um, that infrastructure is already in place in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century. And no longer a headline for most people, and certainly not in this room, but the Germans went to great lengths to actually study what was happening in this country, just as uh, the Afrikaners did um, when the National Party won a major election in 1912 and eventually formalized the in 1948. So when we think about resistance movements, we have to think of them globally. We have to think of the circuits of knowledge that existed amongst a small group of people. One of the more interesting aspects of the early 20th century resistance movements is that they were far more heterogeneous in both the nationality of those who participated um, and in the very US white-black binary, very racially diverse, which is to say that one of the greatest threats to capital and one of the greatest threats of um, solidarity and working class mobilization occurs in the 1870s and 1880s amongst agrarian uh, workers. Some were landowners and farmers, others were farm laborers. Um, a kind of populist movement that represented an interracial solidarity movement uh, that did pose a real threat um, to the southern gentry um, and uh, capitalist elites. Um, many of us know what that looks like in terms of the stories uh, of labor struggle and strife over railroads and monopoly power uh, that give us a formal period we call the Progressive Era in the early 20th century. So why do I give this big frame? Um, because if we are thinking about a book break today, we have to remember that the pressure to use racism as a wedge to divide and conquer these groups um, is not just a story that exists in the Trump era and the way that we think about it. And it's not just an old story that we might know um, of the difference between indentured servants um, and enslaved people. But in fact, yeah, it is an ongoing, um, shape-shifting reality uh, because the consummate threat of white people choosing allyship or choosing common cause with black people is what this is really all about. The sheer dominance over black people is one problem, and the ability of black people to resist amidst the sheer terror or violence is another thing. But the propaganda that exists, the power of fascism, um, is really a power directed to a majority population of white people in this country that have always held the people power capable of overturning the system. Yes. And this is a fight for their hearts and minds. Now, why does that matter? Because the civil rights movement packaged its resistance in the tropes of American exceptionalism and constitutionalism as a rhetorical strategy to compel white people to see their history as on the line. If you believe in your own country, you have to side with us. That came with a great moral power and urgency, but it also came at a significant cost. Because in the legislative victories of that moment that we celebrate annually, um, particularly with the Selma March, which drives me crazy these days, <laughs> because the last 10 of them have been in the midst of a massive entrenchment and state violence against black people, and yet we still go to Selma as if what we're commemorating still reflects the reality that we have when the Voting Rights Act itself has been cut. That's another conversation. Yeah. So this trade-off in rooting the civil rights movement in a kind of story of a community who deserved their citizenship on the very terms that the nation promised them and that the nation set on paper, uh, you know, this famous King line, be true to what you put on paper, um, Lee left us in the wake of those legislative victories with a very narrow understanding of how to measure success after that moment. Mm -hmm. And that narrow understanding um, was not necessarily a uniform understanding within the movement itself amongst the many constituents um, who had fought to varying degrees for both legislative victory, but for something even more expansive about a, a different kind of America, an America of true equality and egalitarianism, an America that uh, recognized that the, you know, I mean, a lot of this is old tropes, but that people, it was as much important to be able to buy a hamburger at a lunch counter than it was to sit at a lunch counter. This is sort of one of the ways 
But the, the economic roots of the populist threat of the late 19th century and what I didn't mention, the more popular front, socialist threat of the 1930s, which brought FDR into a sharper focus. If I'm going to say capitalism, I'm going to have to socialize our economy. Yes. Um, Johnson did the same with Medicaid and Medicare. That threat that was generated by the power of white Americans to tell America, through the perspective of black people, this is not the country we want to live in any longer, was more or less a um, a project that was crushed both in the uh, federal government's attack on the Black Power Movement, which emerges after the Civil Rights Movement, but also in the ideology of individualism that emerges in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement that translates progressive possibility into personal responsibility as the currency of what a post-Civil Rights America was really all about. And as a consequence, I would say, and I'll stop here, you know, going to other, but this is the big takeaway, that these resistance movements were always small to begin with. But if we imagine that the civil rights movement had solved what progressives imagined a different America could look like, it did anything but. It ended up reinforcing that you could paint a vision of a multiracial America by airbrushing black people into it on the very terms in which they had been excluded. Only now you would have black faces in high places standing in to represent this vision of a multiracial America. Not progressive in any way, shape, or form. And indeed, the insidiousness and the deliberateness with which Nixon himself adopted an idea that we can actually save the system as it is by using an old colonial um, process, which is to take the indigenous, pick off some small portion of them, empower them, give them, you know, back in the colonial period of the transatlantic slave trade, you, you know, you give people titles as chief, give them uh, stools to sit on, to make them powerful, cover them in jewelry. Um, and all of a sudden, they, they do all the work of controlling the natives that the colonizer no longer has to do. And it sounds cynical, but actually that's how it works. <laughs> so we have to keep in mind that this tactic worked in the post-civil rights era. A lot of black people showed up in places for the first time only to represent a party of one. Only to be the first and the last who sat in that position. Maybe a second and a third at some point. But that wasn't the intended goal. And also, as James Baldwin often would say, that the price of the ticket was full of civilization to destroy your identity, your sense of self. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I'm using a lot of glib language here in the interest of efficiency, but basically, when you're sitting at the table and someone hands you the menu, and your people are on it, you don't get to change the menu. Or you don't get invited back to the party. So we are struggling with the Obama era, in my opinion, representing the culmination of this strategy that took place after the 1960s. And we will never agree on how conscious Obama himself was of this. But I will tell you, as someone who at least is trying to pay close attention to Obama, uh, when I listened to, I'm sorry, I did listen to it, but when I read, which was an audio, audio book, um, his uh, biography, the first installment of his autobiography, um, Obama makes it plainly clear that there's nothing that we're having a conversation about tonight that he doesn't know. But he chooses, he chooses to fundamentally believe that the American project, as he understands its history, is perfectly sound. That it does not need reworking. It just needs to live up to its potential. And there are many people who believe that it cannot work on its potential because its potential was subsidized by the lives of people whose bodies and whose land were the fuel to create the thing in the first place. And this might sound abstract, and maybe we can end this conversation down the road with a progressive blueprint that recognizes that fundamental tension. But that in and of itself would be progress because we're not even teaching that fundamental tension. All right, I'll stop. Thank you. That was like, that was perfect. That was perfect. Thank you so much.
Okay, um, so Reverend Eric Dodson, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we, we heard the word blueprint, we heard a lot. I know there's a lot in your mind, especially in the meetings that you just came out of earlier today. You are president of the United Black Agenda, which is focused on eliminating a racial wealth gap and repairing past and current arms to black communities. No small goal. But these are key narratives that we think about and mess with all the time. They feel very central to this moment and to the history that Dr. Muhammad just outlined for us. Can you tell us a little bit about the vision um, embedded in that language and how uh, and how they connect to the needs and desires of the black voters as you are seeing right now? Well, let me thank, first of all, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, colleagues on the, on the panel, just extraordinary um, information. And every time I hear a blueprint, I think about Jason, so I'll about some blueprint. But um, it's interesting to me because we are, we're, we're, we're at a space in New Jersey um, that has this huge racial wealth gap, right? Um, but also, I think New Jersey has probably the most, one of the most intelligent black voter population in the country. Do you know New Jersey ranks in the top five in black voter turnout? Yeah, New Jersey ranks top five in black voter turnout. In fact, to Dr. Phil Muhammad's point, we have some folks who've been picked off, but in fact, you cannot win a statewide election if you don't have black support in New Jersey. Um, Murphy had 94% of the black vote when he won his first election. His second election, which was even closer, he had an even higher percentage of the black vote. So what does that tell us? In New Jersey, if you can get black support, you will win a statewide election because the European American vote is always split. So he bucks the 50-year trend. Think about it. Murphy bucks the 50-year trend because New Jersey, you know, we're national elections, we are a blue state. Statewide elections, we're a purple state. We elect a Republican governor, then a Democrat governor, then a Republican governor, then a Democrat. But Murphy was able to buck the 50 year trend because he appealed to black folks uh, uh, at a great mass, right? And so that shows me that New Jersey has a tremendous amount of power amongst the black people if we ever come to that, right? And coalesce around a candidate that we support. Now, I, I, now I'll tell you this. I'll get you to the United Black Agenda. I think we're intellectually smart enough to know, and we talk about why black people, you know, our numbers are still low in terms of compared to the white folks, but why black people, we, we don't fall for the OD though, and for, for the most part of us. If we're not inspired by a candidate, we're not going to vote. Right? That's just like, and Obama inspired us. Right? Yes, we can. <laughs> right? And I believe right now, Kamala is inspired. We'll see what happens, but the numbers don't lie. We, we, New Jersey's in the top five when it comes to black voter turnout, and why is that? We need, to, we need to unpack that. And this is why the United Black Agenda came, came about, right? We are a coalition of 10 of the, the leading black civil rights organizations in the state of New Jersey. And we recognize the fact that when Murphy was running the first time, the need for us to come together with collective power to get some significant legislation passed and not just come to the new governor, one by one, organization by organization. Does that make sense? So we are all 10 independent organizations, but we are all a collective organization of 501c3. So if you want to donate, you can go for We're a 501c3 that comes together to get legislation passed and build that collective black voting power that we understand New Jersey has a need to deal with the economic racial disparities in this in the state. Um, but also understand that the power, if we ever come together, we can get significant. Let me give you examples. So of course, New Jersey, uh, the median household income among European Americans is like 300 something thousand um, in New Jersey, and the black population is uh, African Americans are like 17, a little over 17,000. So there's a, a, a huge, huge racial wealth gap, and that we are addressing uh, each and every day through affordable housing as we advocate for. New Jersey's Monroe Doctrine and outlining the current system. We just passed a huge, tremendous law that will help speed, uh, speed up the production of affordable housing in New Jersey, which we're about 200,000 units behind, right? We just got, you know, with the help of um, uh, the United Black Agenda, we 
we've gotten over the last two budgets, close to maybe 60 to 70 million dollars in the budget for first generation home ownership. You know, let me repeat that. First generation home, because we know first time homeowners, there are other folks that qualify that we want to get down to the census track of folks whose parents have never owned a home, who've been uh, you know, stripped for, because of racial segregation and, and racist housing policy. So we're seeing the numbers of uh, African Americans home ownership getting the numbers are going up because we advocate for over fifty million dollars of, of uh, this pilot program. We want to continue to do that. We also, um, through the leadership of, you know, we come together whoever is the expert in a particular field. So we, uh, that's how the United Black Agenda works. So that um, the Institute for Social Justice led the charge with the United Black Agenda to get eight, eighty-three thousand folks on probation and parole the right to vote in New Jersey. Right. So these are the things that we're working on. Um, Reverend Boyer, Salvation of Social Justice, I was just on a, a call where they're organizing black clergy around the state around voter turnout um, and the work that Reverend Boyer is doing around uh, infant, um, maternal infant health, uh, what he's doing around uh, reshaping uh, community hubs for policing, dealing with that issue. So we're, we come together to really try to impact the lives of African Americans and make sure they're not just surviving but thriving around policy, around issues policy that impact our communities tremendously, and I say this like, you know, many of us don't, maybe some of us don't realize, I think 95% of our lives are impacted by policy. Yeah. And so when we look at policy, and not just getting, let me be clear, it's not just about getting a, a civil rights bill passed or a policy passed. If it ain't in the budget, it ain't gonna work. So we're also advocating for the resources behind that. One of the things that we did in the United Black Agenda through Fair Share Housing Center, it was the Fair Chance and Housing Act. This is, this is one of the strongest statewide laws in the country that limits the use of criminal background check folks applying for a house apartment. Because they were going back 20 years, <laughs> going criminal background check for 20 years. New Jersey has the strongest statewide law on limiting the use of criminal background checks. And what we were, cleverly did was ask the staff of the Department of um, the Division of Civil Rights. They put it in the budget, they hired staff, and uh, Assemblyman Benjamin Wong, we just talked about the number of cases that are open that there. The DCA, um, the Division of Civil Rights, are going after and prosecuting these landlords that abuse the law. So, the United Black Agenda is focused on making sure black communities thrive and not just survive, and we're doing it through policy, coming together by collective power, understanding the history of our, our foremothers and our forefathers who taught us that collective power, as Dr. King called, constructive alliances. Now, we are in, we are a 501c3, but we have independent autonomy, but that constructive alliance is around our desire to really uh, bring the address New Jersey's huge racial disparity. And we know the historical implications of New Jersey being the last in the state that ended slavery, you know, all the policing issues that are going around in New Jersey. So, it's important. We see the need to address the racial wealth gap um, and the economics around New Jersey being one of the wealthiest states in the nation, one of the most diverse states in the nation, but also one of the most segregated. And it's interesting to me, and I'll just stop here, you know, when I think about history and opportunity. And I say, this is just my opinion. I, I think LBJ was the last president well, actually, I think, I, would just say, I think he was the greatest president of civil rights because I, 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 before LBJ, if you count the legislation, there were eight pieces of civil rights legislation leading up to LBJ. Eight pieces of civil rights legislation in this country. He passed four of the eight. And we turn. For them, four of the eight was passed under LBJ's and to Dr. Muhammad's point. The Great Society Initiative was the last time we had a serious conversation about poverty. We haven't had that conversation since 1968. And what he was trying to do in the Great Society Initiative, and what you know, what I think about what the United Black Agenda is trying to do is to build these coalitions to bring about change, to try to shift, you know, to shift our country from, you know, we, we, you know, Dr. King said, you know, the rich did. Socialism, the poor, the 
capitalism. And then think about that for a moment, right? Dr. King wasn't assassinated because he was trying to inter integrate lunch counters. That's not why. His Beyond Vietnam speech when he was talking about reshaping America's economic situation is what got him assassinated. So when he came out publicly and opposed the war in Vietnam and talked about shifting the economic platform of America to a more just, equitable society, he gave that speech April 4th, 1967. April 3rd, 19, April 3rd, no, April 4th, 1967, King gave that speech. He was assassinated April 4th, 1968, one year later. They wouldn't bother him, King, when you're talking about integrated lungs count. When you talk about reshaping America's economic system, that's what got him assassinated. So when we think about looking at here, particularly in New Jersey, how we reshape the economic system in New Jersey, you know, it's going to cost. You know, it's going to cost um, for us to really reimagine what we can do in New Jersey with a voting population of African Americans who has one of the highest turnouts in the country. That's power. We the UVA recognize the power. Now, there are a lot of situations. You know, preachers always say, I'm not, this is my last point. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> it is my last, this is my last point. Um, you can recognize that power and recognize there were some, there were some issues that really harnessed that power or didn't, didn't allow that power to be released. And that was, that was because of what we call in New Jersey the party line. Now that party line was no more. And before they even create that, we really need to coalesce around getting African Americans together about building a rural, powerful voting block that has significant change for our community. Thank you so much. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to ask each of you wonderful people a question and ask that you answer it as briefly as possible, which I understand the challenge to this. And then we're going to uh, hopefully have a conversation with our beautiful audience. So, uh, Dr. White. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 um, we do this. Um, okay, so here's here's my question to you. Yes, I know it's not showing my question. Um, okay, activist scholars who write about class. So you know, not everybody wants to change the economic system. That, 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 uh, okay, activist scholars who write about class and the black voter are often concerned that black liberals and white leftists are willing to leave behind the most economically vulnerable in our communities. What do you think about this? <laughs> do you think it's true that we vote against our best interests? I'm like, I'm really sitting with all of this, right? Like, I'm like, I'm sh I've been struggling, right? Because Adams, right, in New York, you see what's happening there. Yes. Their black mayoral leadership. We're watching in Philly as the black mayor there is destroying Chinatown for development. I came here, I was arrested in uh, Philly when uh, the mayor there was trying to pass a law that banned sharing food with homeless people. Um, and so I was outside I was trying to figure out how my friends could get this meeting because, of course, he put it. He's also a black man, Mayor Nutter, um, who's DA ended up going to prison. And he um, he put this meeting in the smallest possible room he could find. Um, in a, and then brought a bunch of cops to stand outside the front door to intimidate everybody who was trying to go in to help homeless people. Um, and to my surprise, when I went back to Jersey, Ross Barack was trying to pass the same bed in Newark. And, and nobody was doing anything, actually. So I was like, what is happening in Jersey? At least in Philly, we were going to the meeting, I was going to jail, like things were happening. Um, and here, it was just silence. Uh, so, so I have a ton of pessimism I'm grappling with around black leadership and what happens when you put black people in these spaces, especially in black cities, um, and what happens to the people in them, right? Like, Adams in his first month was like, cutting food you give to children, and he was like forcing them to eat. He said he was vegan, and then he wasn't vegan. But he was he was taking meat from the children, and then he was, housing was terrible. There was a, a huge 
huge fire, and it turned out his friend, who was also a shady developer, was running housing there. So I, um, I mean, fortunately, his house of cards is falling down right now, which is very good in, in terms of what's happening about policing and cops running after children and threatening them with guns. Um, I, I'm grappling with all this. So anyway, I would just say very shortly in terms of like thinking about poverty. To me, I do keep coming back to poverty. I come back to the fact that Kamala Harris, I have yet, Kamala, sorry, Harris, has, I have yet to hear her say poverty in a speech. And I'm sure she has. I just have not heard it. I Googled it today, could not find it. I, um, I, the policies, I've heard her talk about economic policies, a lot of them seem to be about development, housing, um, or child tax credits, which actually don't really help the most vulnerable because of how little money they make. And so I'm struggling, I guess, at, at that point about what, what that is. Thank you. So, Dr. Muhammad, how do you feel the power that Reverend Thompson spoke about? What are the stumbling blocks that explain? what Dr. White is outlining, what she is grappling with. What is happening such that we don't have a structural assessment of racial capitalism and we just keep venerating individuals and we just then are stunned that we see the house of cards fall down again and again and again? Yeah. Well, the, the short answer is that we have a very poorly educated uh, population in general, across the board, uh, white people, Black people, the only people who are well educated in this country are H 1B visa immigrants. <laughs> Literally, people who have received excellent education in their own countries and then by virtue of that excellent education get to come here um, and you know, by the luck of the lottery ticket um, live their American dream. So, education is a huge stumbling block. And let me be more precise political education is uh, at the cornerstone of a uh, populace that understands what the values of democratic participation in governance look like and how to judge the merits of policies that would benefit or harm them. Mm -hmm. um, and we just do a bad job. So there's a, a million data points to make this point. I'll just mention a couple simple ones, which is that uh, we know for a fact how badly Americans are taught cities in general. We are watching in real time how legislative activity is designed specifically to limit or censor knowledge about American history across multiple uh, fields, subjects, axes, you name it. Um, which is the proof in the pudding that how children are socialized in a democracy as the earliest Enlightenment philosophers imagined a functioning democracy would work um, is at the cornerstone of what kind of democracy you actually get. <laughs> One that uh, creates a marketplace of ideas where people have, you know, as economists might say, perfect knowledge. Right? You know, our economic system is built on a model that if everyone has transparency to the value of goods and services, then the price will be the optimal price because people will choose what they're paying for. Of course, in the real world, people don't have perfect knowledge. Um, so that is the answer to your question, the very short answer. To be more precise, and maybe connect to what uh, Khadija just described, um, I mean, it's outrageous what's happened in New York. But we have to remember that Eric Adams won in a ranked choice voter election where clearly he had the majority support. He was the first preference of people who, who we might call working class black New Yorkers and brown New Yorkers. He was their guy. And the question we could ask ourselves is, how is it possible that a former cop who had continued to uh, run on a law and order mandate um, could be elected in the wake of everything that's happened in that city. But for the fact that New York City has always been a place where even for working class people who are the most vulnerable to community violence have been told that the only way out of this mm -hmm. is more and better policing. Mm -hmm. That is not a progressive message, and indeed many progressive organizations have fought against that messaging, but it has been a hard road to travel. Yes. So, 
So there is really no pathway to the kind of collective action that would rally around progressive values for low-income black voters, but for some form of organized political education. And I'll close, at least with this question, with the alternative, which is working brilliantly. The alternative is the mobilization of low-income and poorly educated white Americans who are being taught propaganda and how to mobilize that propaganda in the form of voter participation at every level of our political economy, from school board elections to county clerks to uh, state registrars and county clerks and you name it. Now, much of what they've been taught and what they're being mobilized to do is false information and misinformation. But that is the point. It works if, if you engage people at a fundamental level about the, the importance of how the system works and what they need to know, they will be motivated to invest and engage in the system. And, and the thing to me, probably the greatest tragedy, I didn't know, uh, Reverend Dobson, that um, the, the black turnout was so high in New Jersey. The question I would ask, really quickly to finish this point, is it true at all levels of voter participation or was it only true in the quadrennial presidential race? Quadrennial elections. Correct. Yeah. So this is where we are losing, and we will continue to lose over and over again. If black voters are only showing up or overperforming every four years for a presidential race, for an office that actually has the least power to determine the fate of the lives of most people, then it is a fool's gesture, by and large. Thank you. Last question. Last question, and then uh, we're going to open it up. How do we address this fool's error, this every four years? How do we, what does the United Black Agenda want to think through as a blueprint for marginalized groups and their allies as a need to fight this constant yeah. cycle? Yeah, to clarify what I said earlier, yes, it, it, it's going to presidential lessons. The midterms aren't, aren't that high at all. Um, I, I just want to say, I, I, know, I know this is about, to your point, Dr. Muhammad, I believe that we have challenges in the black community, and there are historical challenges around how we've been assimilated in this country. But I would argue that it is European American white folks that fall for the Obi Dope because their problem, white poverty in this country is, is astronomical. And they still fight, uh, fight to make sure they stay poor because they vote against their interests every year in midterms and presidential. Like if you look at the data, who white Americans support, I mean, I you know this guy coming up, he cares nothing about them. You know, uh, you know. There are more white folks on welfare than there's black folks. But they consistently vote against their interests. Consistently support a party who cares nothing about them. At least our folks are fight. We, we may, we may, you know, <laughs> you know, fall for them. Some of us didn't take off and fall. But at least we, we never stop fighting. That, that, that's, that's, that's the untold story about African Americans in this country, we've been fighting when we, we, since they brought to the shores, we've been fighting. Our folks fight to tell this country to live up to that principle. Now, they picked a lot of us off, but I, I gotta tell you, I, I, you know, I am hopeful because what, what we're trying to do, and I think to your, to your, to answer your question is really, and to your point, Dr. Uh, um, White, is really trying to educate our, our, our folks and the importance of midterm elections and the importance of policy because we've been sold a bill of goods and we've been disappointed so much because then I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to vote because no one's inspiring me, no one cares. You know, that, like, I, if you can look at it one way. You can look at it one way and say, black people don't come out to vote because they're not educated. Or you look at black people don't come out to vote because that's not a candidate that's inspiring them, that's speaking to them. There's two ways to look at it. And I choose to look at it like, give us somebody that we can be inspired by, you know, we'll support them, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt. But you know, black folk, we're very welcome and we'll, we'll trust you until you burn us. Um, I just think, I just think, you know, 
what we're trying to do is like the call to my before I got out here. The black institutions that once was the backbone of our community, trying to reinvigorate black clergy around policy, right? Educate black clergy around policy. Our black institutions, that's why we're united like a gender came together, the, the leading civil rights groups in the, in, in the state of Missouri to really shape policy, right? And it takes time. It takes time for policy to be implemented and, 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 and for, for housing laws to take place. You know, we, we, we're short 200,000 units because of the politics in Missouri and, um, and governors and the um, Council of Affordable Housing just stalling the delay of the building of the construction of affordable housing. It takes time for these new policies to be implemented and take shape. But I, I do think, I do think that the blueprint or getting back to what's not new, the United Black Agenda is not new about bringing black leadership together, is what our forefathers and foremothers done, have, have done. We're just trying to re engage that and really go back to do what, you know, what we, when we think about Dr. King's work, you know, they had to be trained and prepared for the civil rights. I mean, they, they were, you know, you weren't just going to be, you know, walking out there and someone spitting in your face and you not retaliating. That, that didn't happen. Try that today. You see, that. We, you know, there's a lot of training and tools and thinking about about the concept of the philosophy of nonviolence, right? So we have to really go back to the philosophy of how do we understand the philosophy around uh, economics, around social, you know, social conditions, and, and understand what our communities have been endured for generations and generations, and and really try to unpack that for them to understand why. This is so important. This is why you have to vote. You know, I think about Dr. Howard, you know, Howard Thurman and um, his book, Jesus in Disinherited, when he talks about why, you know, blacks, you know, some black folks did feel no need to vote. What, what for? Not, nothing's going to change, you know. Howard Thurman is a genius. And I think about, you know, how do we get people to understand who Howard Thurman was, right, before Dr. King, right? How do we get folks to, to understand who J.A. Rogers was, who wrote, wrote about sex and race and his whole concept, his myth about race. How do we, you know, Ivan Van Sorderbaum who taught in, in at Rutgers, like, getting our folks to understand that we have a history of violence. How, how do we get our folks to understand that the propaganda that we see on television, like, do you know there was a black emperor in Rome? Did you, you guys know that? Rome was a diverse society. But we don't talk about it. Like, this is a ton of stuff. I gotta stop. <laughs> <laughs> but, but to, to push back, and I know I'm not supposed to because I'm the moderator, I love every every single thing you're saying, but there's a, a, a third way to think about this too, which is it's easy to then make this black people's fault. If, 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 if Trump, would, if, if it can become, well, black people didn't do this, and black people didn't do that, and black people weren't enough of it, it, it turns into black people's fault. So the, for me, I go back to what happened to the Rainbow Coalition. What happened to, so this broader need and demand for broader political education that includes, includes actually includes white people. Absolutely. White people, you know, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I, I, I did a moderator stuff. But that's why I started with saying that New Jersey, yeah. but to your point, New Jersey yeah. in the president. Is it a top five in black folks? Because we don't think, like Ibram X. Kennedy said, the only thing wrong with black people is thinking something wrong with black people, right? And, and we, yeah. we've been socialized in this country to believe that, right? Yes. Yes. Even black people themselves. I just, I like going back to the history of yeah. the Klan in Jersey and like, and white people beating up the Klan when they showed up in certain places and the kind of unity of labor and how that helped mobilize. So like, when you talk about like the 1920s, and what happens in the 30s, you're also talking about this fracturing of whiteness that allowed and opened up a space for some of that kind of transracial uh, mobilizing. Okay, so so I'm going to read a, a couple of statistics very briefly, and then I hope that we're going to get some questions from you all, okay? Just last week, the NAACP released its findings of a poll targeting 14 and a half million black voters across 12 priority states where the black community holds significant electoral power. The, the, the headlines. Most, in other words, 78% of black voters polled are feeling the same or more excited 
than when President Obama first ran, with more than half, 56%, being more excited now than in 2008. This just came out six days ago. We're crossing the children. Well, okay, but okay, let's say a second bullet. <laughs>
the whole, um, what's going on in the district attorney's office with restorative justice, all of that is coming out of this like little moment of intensity of a bunch of like grad students and undergrads and high school students who came together and said what can do with, with homeless people, right? I mean, that was part of the radicalization of Occupy was that we were sleeping on the street with people who did not have homes. And when the campment, when the cops came and said, we're gonna take all of your tents, they came to us and said, where do our things go? Right? It was the first time that they had a safe space where people weren't taking their things every day. Um, and so, I don't know, I feel like, you know, this is like when Don Mitchell, who's a culture geographer, writes a public space. The public space is really incredibly important. Like, part of, you know, I'm having like this person going at like the public pool locally. Um, people will put pool on my, my grave when I die. Um, but part of that is about like the importance of public spaces, actually, and what happens in public spaces. I know this is like modernity and like the promise of the city and all that stuff, and, and all that gets torn up in certain ways, but I do really believe in it. So part of what I think happens is like being politicized, so politicized, but also having spaces where that can happen. And so what to me Adams also represents the co-optation of the church, the black church and like the existing institutions. All these people who are showing up to places of laying hands on them and stuff like that. Like that is that is to me about subverting like the radical potential of black institutions. And I think part of what we have to do is like undo some of that. And that has to do with the, that existing hierarchy there too. More questions? Of the students 
papers. I ask my students to write an autobiography uh, every semester. Um, if I were to create an archive and show you how many students, parents as immigrants, um, articulate to them some version of anti-black racism. Um, don't be like them. Don't socialize with them. Um, don't uh, fall into um, a community where you're too close to them. Uh, and this is not just for South Asian or Asian immigrant children. This is also for black immigrant children. Um, so this is anecdotal from the perspective of a sample of, at this point, hundreds of students that I've taught almost over a decade. Now, that being said, there's also a small minority of students who articulate, this is what my parents have told me, but this is my experience, and these are my politics. So what I'm answering, the way I'm answering your question is to say that the same problem exists in the immigrant community as the problem I'm concerned about, about the miseducation of, uh, of the largest demographic in this country of low-income people. That we are in a very stratified um, society, and so most people are low-income, period. With the notable exception of a class of immigrants um, who are uh, filtered into this country for precisely the reason um, that we don't have to pay to educate immigrants and then we can somewhat underpay them for their work, and then we can kick them out if we don't like the way they behave. And so it's a win-win-win in terms of our uh, policies. The solution to this, of course, would be that we would create communities um, of knowledge and uh, political education, and that's already happening, um, but we could do it with much greater urgency and with much more intentionality and not in the reactionary way in which um, organizations like Asians for Black Lives um, emerged in the wake of what happened uh, to Michael Brown and others in Sandra Bland uh, during that period. Um, we do have the agency and possibility for educating immigrants about precisely the way that they've been used as a cultural wedge. I'll just finish on this point. The role of model minorities, of which Asians are overrepresented in this country, um, to reject the political demands of native-born blacks and Hispanics, or Latinos by and large, has been going on for 50 or 60 years. The problem is that not only is it accelerating in this moment, but it is extending to increasing numbers of black people who are now standing in as, we don't call them model minorities, but both the obvious in terms of uh, the overrepresentation of Nigerians on elite college camp campuses, um, but also native-born African Americans. Uh, Obama is a model minority. Whenever someone pointed to Obama as the exception that proved that America was not a racist country or did not have structural racism, Obama was being positioned as a model minority. And he himself often leaned into and reinforced this problem. So the people need to understand the way the model minority myth cuts against efforts to mobilize against policies that are harmful to the majority of people who are not benefiting from a system that is not meant to provide an adequate economic floor and social uh, safety net for low income people. Can I say something really quickly? Yeah. Um, in addition to what, what Dr. Muhammad said, I think that there's a serious problem broadly with education. So what, what, what we don't have here in the United States is also lacking in a lot of other places, right? So, you know, I had an Asian student uh, who's an international East Asian student. I teach at the new school. During COVID, you know, I ended up on a Zoom with this person, and they were ranting and angry and really trying to redirect their own anti-black uh, 
about racism because they had been pushed down some stairs at, at Union Square. And so I found myself as a black Korean person speaking to this person. They, was, they were really trying to understand their feelings. One of the things that this young lady said to me was, why do you all <laughs> keep calling me Asian? I'm not, I, you know, it's a, anyway, to, we, we got into this conversation where, you know, when you're in, 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 she's Korean, in Korea, you don't call yourself Asian. You know, it, this is a very uniquely Western American point of view that um, she did not know was going to happen to her when she came here because her education is not transnational. It is not based in decolonization or history of empire and um, the international, the transatlantic slave trade. She's not getting that education. Where, and then here, we are certainly not getting that education. Maybe you're getting when you're in college, if you have a couple of professors that you bump into, but so I would just say that there is a problem. It is a global problem where we are not studying each other. There is no mutual study of each other, such that this young lady is coming here and she's like, why are you on the Asian? Right? And so and I understand that you know she's she's 19 years old, but we have a global problem. I would you know, that's one of the things that I try, you know, I'm, I'm out to dismantle the concept of race. Like, part of the challenge in America is that white people, many white people think they're white, and they have no idea of the national. Like, I, like I was, I was when, uh, when COVID happened, it was like, okay, let's do an icebreaker. Uh, if you could speak a second language, what would it be? And everybody went around and I was like, it's English, yeah, and they would be Spanish, German, they said, Reverend Dawson, what do you stop? I would like to speak my native language, but I don't know what that is. And that was the reaction I got. I like, mm -hmm. So I went home proud that I did that. Right? And I said, oh shit. Half of them don't know what they're, can't speak their native language. Because I haven't even thought about how many of y'all speak your native language? Raise your hand. How many of you even know what your native language is? That's what America does, it strips you of who you are. You're not white, you're French, Dutch, German, as Jane Baldwin said, you came here French, Dutch, German, and you became white. They have no concept of who you are. Hmm. And that, that's, that's the, that's the diabolicalness of assimilation, and that's why we, we struggle to have this conversation to connect on a human level, because some of us think we're white. And that's why poor white people go against their interests just as more so than poor black people. Because they've been so, and you listen to Dr. King's speech, they, 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 you, know, he, he, you know, he gave them Jim Crow, and they ate Jim Crow. As long as you know, they worked for pennies, and they ate Jim Crow. But what they had was their whiteness. That's what America has done to us. Not just black people, but all of us. Baldwin well, we said, when an Italian guy comes over here and becomes a guy named Joe, then he's lose all sense of who they are. And that, that's what I'm trying to get people to understand, like the humanity of us, of all of us human beings. Yes, our culture matters. Yes, our ethnic group matters. And when we lose sense, when we lose a sense of that, that's why we're easily fooled to be racist, sexist, and because we don't have no clue who we are. Any other question right here?
when when it comes to um, the every four years, you know, the flow yeah. running, we're looking at like this big picture instead of seeing the power of the grassroots act, seeing the power of organizations like this, seeing the power of um, you know local politics. It's kind of like an identity issue. Yeah. Um, I mean, so there's a kind of crass uh, take on this, take it, take it for what it's worth. I mean, the Democratic Party in this state and in many places does not encourage wide-scale participation mm -hmm. in local races mm -hmm. because they rig the system yeah. to position the people they want um, as a series of favors and trades and earned privileges. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not like they're running around saying, we want people to participate in democracy. You know, the, the, the easiest way for all of you to get involved is to either convince someone you know who would be really good at doing something because they are good at it and their values are ones that would promote transparency in government and good governance in general, or do it yourself. But if someone is already in line for the next local office, which is the stepping stone to the slightly bigger local office, which is the stepping stone to the other bigger office, we are captured by a Democratic Party that is actually not that interested in mass participation in these local races. So the, you know, I can accept a certain amount of like white people's ice is colder than ours problem, which is internalized racism, and it's certainly a problem. But I think, more practically speaking, part of the demobilization of people at the grassroots level serves a party establishment that is not that interested in that until they show up and knock on your door and say, it's time for you to get out and vote. And then you're like, oh, OK. Um, I would say I was publicly on the radio calling for Joe Biden's um, uh, resignation within hours of that debate performance. And it was shocking to me, not just that party elites were lying to all of our faces, that not only was he OK, but including AOC, but that this was the best way forward. I mean, I mean, you know, like, let's just go back two months, because that's what was happening. But on Facebook and in my social media, where I was saying this to people like you and my friends, most of them were pushing back. No, we shouldn't do this. No, we... so like, when does it stop? Because if we allow ourselves to continue to take our marching orders from the Democratic Party elite, who are constantly droning on about how they got this and how they they figured it out and they know better. I mean, Quentin Falk said for two years that the polls didn't matter. That as Trump was geared up to run for re-election. And all the polls were showing Biden was going to lose. The black head of the campaign um, uh, party, whatever, I'm losing my words, I've been, it's been a long day. Um, person campaign strategist for Joe Biden, Joe Biden was saying, we shouldn't listen to the polls. Jim Clyburn was saying, we'll meet the press. Oh, remember when they counted Obama out back in 2008? He proved them wrong. I was like, oh, really? But now do the polls count? Of course they do. So this is what I mean about political education. Like local machine politicians, all the way up the line to elite party Democrats, don't always have our best interests in mind. They have the interests of the party in mind. Sometimes the party interests align. Sometimes they don't. Are their party interests, even when they don't align, a gazillion times better than the other party's party interests? Right now, yes. Not always true, but certainly right now, yes. Um, I, uh, okay, so the thing that's in front of me on my paper is that there are 40 million Americans living in poverty right now. It's uh, about 12% of the population. That, in the word of the hand, I said that earlier, the word poverty has not come up uh, in this election very much. That stands out to me in terms of this question of democracy and who we expect to get activated and who we expect to not be activated when these elections roll around. Um, but also, like, I'm just gonna, I'm glad you said that from the 
Or is that me? Because I feel like I have I came here, I came out of Philly and I came to Jersey and I was like, I want to see what's up with these suburbs. You know, I'm gonna get active a little bit. Um, and I'm gonna talk about race and uh, talk about like let's just do some transformative stuff. Um, and yeah, there's a there's a wall um, in terms of organizing. There's a wall in terms of like who people, you know, who they think they should be pleasing. You know, who who you know. And I thought that a lot of this was national politics, like these dynamics of what constituents you really should care about, what constituents you really should be serving. But that happens on a local level as well, and it happens repeatedly over and over again. Um, whose interests get put ahead of other interests? Whose voices get put ahead of other voices? So uh, I, I don't know. That's that's what's standing out to me, which is just like, well, where do you start, right? I mean, like you can be in it. Like to me, I'm like, someone has this thing where they have this like rabble rousing black person. I mean, like, I feel like every year they roll through. It's so, like maybe that's been my thing, and I'm gonna retire and somebody else pick up. Um, but I think. Part of that is this kind of, because the co-optation also happens. Like someone was telling me about, you know, something that happened in the late 90s with a black kid who was accused of stealing, who was accused of intruding into uh, the middle school because he, he went back to see a teacher and they pressed charges and this whole thing, right? Um, and, and a global black politician was part of the people going after this child. And so, like, I, I keep trying to figure out how do you even intervene in the local level? And part of my, again, pessimism has to do with, like, even, and I can't even help with the school board, or if I can't even help with the, you know, with the mayor's break, like, it's all volunteers, you know, like, like what, what is the entry point here in terms of trying to get people politicized, trying to get white people politicized, right, because they care when, like, there's, like, pussycats and um, Trump is in the White House, but I feel like the politicization, like, suddenly disappears when they have a more familiar kind of person in power. So anyway, that's some of the stuff I'm wrestling. And, and you can't ignore the economics of it, right? So the economics of the run for office costs. Right? So it takes money to run for position. Mm -hmm. And and both machines know that. And they they utilize that. That's how they pick people off. You know, you know, I'm gonna get you elected. You can run on my ticket, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But now you owe them. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> so that I mean that's the that's the politics that you know you know, hopefully with the, the line being down in New Jersey, there's a window of opportunity for folks to organize. And this is what United Black Agenda, you know, we... Well, we, we need to come together. Yeah. Right? That's part that's, of it is the progressive yeah, and the state actually have to build together so that we can have more voices. We get picked off, too. Yeah, and that, that you know, we, we have a C3 and a C4. Yeah. Because that's where, the, the, you know, the money, the money speaks. And so we need to raise the resources and have collective mindset around what we want to achieve and really have an opportunity, this small window of New Jersey, to reshape the, the, you know, the policy of New Jersey is here. And so history matters. The, 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 you know, whenever there are significant things that happen, it's always timing. Either the timing was, we, we take, took advantage of the timing, or we didn't. And I always come back to, what if there was a second Johnson administration in the war ended? What would a great society look like if we had a second term when we had, you know, go back and look at, that's the last time we talked about poverty. Go back and look at the great society initiative where we got Medicare, Medicaid, Head Start, the, the dominant arts, all, all these things that we enjoy today that we think about that help stave off some issues of poverty. Go back and look at what, do you know the, you know the, the HUD was the office was intended to create integrated communities throughout America. That's what HUD was. Guess who the first HUD secretary was? George Romney, Mitt Romney's dad. And he was actually doing it. And Nixon got a hold of him and fired him. You know, like, and so this is what, like, history, what if, what if, and I believe, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll stop talking about that, I believe once Johnson realized that he lost King's support, it was, he was, okay, it was done, because I'm not running again. Um, I have a question. Um, it, what it brings, what it um, by the way, me at like, <laughs> the rainbow coalition and then I think it was um if you were mentioning um us having to get together <coughs> work together and unify. One of the things that really bothers me is that I believe that at the very core of the 
Republican um, policies and their activities and everything that they're doing is aimed at resistance to what they call the proud of America. That's so bad in 20, 50, 20, 40, and things like that. I think that is basically what they're doing, attacking um, uh, immigrants, attempting to make uh, people of color and people of the globe doing all of the things that they're trying to do in 20, uh, Project 2025. Now, since America is grounded, how do we come together as with common goals against what is happening with um, the conservatives and to fight against their attempt to maintain the power of white males in this country? Um, how do people of color, how do people who are marginalized and their allies come together to take our power back to resist what's, what they are attempting to do in this country? I'll take a stab at it. The Browning of America, that entire narrative, it's, it's simple scapegoating. So while America may be Browning, white people are suffering and don't realize it and are staring at the flag of America is Browning. So if my answer to your question is we have to meet people's needs. And the way that we meet people's needs is we have to be way more radical with our economic policies. We have to decommodify quite a lot to meet people's needs. So to, for me, you know, this idea that your wealth accumulation primarily occurs through your home ownership fundamentally means that black people, let's just talk about black people because we're black and we care about black people in this conversation, black people will never catch up, period. If wealth accumulation primarily occurs through home ownership, it's a wrap because it's, it's, it's too late. So the problem is we cannot accept this level of economic discussion. We cannot accept the idea that we may need to completely overhaul how we understand, for instance, housing. For instance, the idea that everyone needs a place to be, a place to live. That it's not just if you're a professor at Harvard, Rutgers, or the New School, or you're a fancy um, scholar, reverend, combo person, that you have a place to live. Right. So, so this is this is the challenge. One of the things that um, Dr. Muhammad and I are overlapping with. He's overseeing the New Jersey Reparations Council. I sit on the Environmental Justice Committee of the council that he is overseeing. And one of the things that we are talking about in the context of reparations is how we have a fulsome and capacious conversation about how we meet people's needs. Now, some people are like, give me my little $10,000 check. The, the issue is, um, that is not a, that is a, um, it, it would be about that if you try and count everything. And the, the problem with that is, number one, it feels really good like that ice cream sundae, you know, you shouldn't really have, and then later you're bloated and you feel terrible. It's not going to last. What we need is change that will last, because the harm that's been done is intergenerational. So um, when we're ready to have that de decommodification conversation, I'm ready to have that conversation. That's a very hard conversation. I totally agree. I, 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 I don't think Republicans resist the ground of America. That's just a tool to exploit. America exploits. That's what it's about. It's about exploiting to the, to the, like, you know, the government had to step in. I don't know if he ever got it, but Elon Musk was going to cash out $56 billion. It's like, like, the, the 1%, and I'm not, America's about exploiting the, 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 that class of people is about making sure black, white, whatever you want to call yourself, you know, are exploited to its highest degree and they, they invent race to do it. Because that people went to, to the what they put, $40 million a dinner, a seat to go to the, like that, the 
wealth at that level, they're interested in keeping their wealth and keeping exploiting us. So race, class, all this stuff is just tools to do that. That's all it is. You know? and, 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 and unfortunately, that exploitation started with human travel. When they bring our ancestors over, they had free labor. And they built the wealth of the world off of free labor. So, you, so they could give. You think they would give that up? So we, we had the outlaws and said, okay, we'll give them Jim Crow. And they all, a lot of white people say they're white. And they'll blame black people say black people are lazy. And some of the hardest working people in the world are. <laughs> so I'm going to do something we don't often do. I'm going to offer some constructive suggestions for how we move forward. Um, and that is that um, let's just say that President Kamala Harris wins, or Vice President Kamala Harris wins. And in her um, unique multiracial identity, as was true with the opportunity with Obama, but an opportunity that did not be fully realized, let's call her a second of a kind, not a first. Right? If you lean into her first, then we're going to give her a pass. But if we embrace her secondness, uh, that we've been here before, then we should build local communities of political clubs and organizations that hold everybody top to bottom accountable for the mobilization that won her that seat. And that just like we've seen these Zoom phenomena, I think Oprah's doing one tonight, yes. right? Um, but the Irish had one, the black women had yes. one, the brothers yes. had one, the rich white guys had yes. one. Yes. To me, these, the possibilities here are that these are embryonic manifestations of the possibility of people being organized on day one of her presidency, such that they can begin to be mobilized at every level of the political system to make real the possibilities of what her symbolism suggests. Yes. Because if we don't do something differently, if we don't take the energy that has yet again been mobilized to elect her, just as was true with the energy that was mobilized to elect Obama, then we will squander yet again our people power. And our people power at the local level is the very people power where the Democrats are like, we got to get people to the polls. I have been in more than enough closed door conversations with party elites and other influential people. I won't name any names, but trust me, people who were at the top, I'll just name one, Valerie Jarrett, in the room. And the complaint in the conversation from grassroots organizers is like, you guys keep asking us to get people out to vote for various Democratic elites. At the time, it was um, the guy running in Alabama, uh, Roy, what was his name? Uh, or more, yeah. uh, won a rare Senate seat as a Democrat in Alabama at the time. And then you pay overwhelmingly white political consultants to tell you how to do this. They get paid, you know, six figure salaries, and black people come out and do what they're told, and then everybody goes home and they show four years later, or midterm, or two years later, for a presidential race. That's a definition of insanity. So now we have an opportunity to say, we love you, Kamala. You, you represent the global south in all of its beauty and glory. We are so grateful um, of your, for your sacrifice. But now we're going to hold you accountable from the most local level. And unlike Obama, who literally told black people, I got this, and took great umbrage and exception to Black Lives Matter activists making demands on him as if he was somehow responsible. Like, why am I responsible for a policy agenda that would address the systemic inequality that exists in this? We cannot do the same thing again. So we can unify around a commitment to building political organizations that will hold the Democratic Party or will build independent parties that won't end up with lunatics like Robert Kennedy, <laughs> but will actually build a base of people. And we may not feel the candidate that can run for Senate, but we can build independent candidates yeah. who begin to learn the policy apparatus of our communities. And over time, we are much stronger in this work. So we're doing closing yeah. comments now.
So what actually art dictates life, and what it's really actually doing is the creativity, the imagination of artists. We all are creators. We all are artists. So let's imagine and create a world. How do you want it to be? One of my favorite plays that my son has been on Broadway is on Hades Town. He just flew back from Japan. He did a production of Rent in Japan and he's back in, back in Queens. He just got back in Queens. <laughs> Hades Town was one of my favorite shows he was in on Broadway. And it says, it says this line that has stuck with me. I like, just can't get out of my head. The boy was a muse, he was a genius. He chose to live in the world as it could be in spite of the way it is. It makes me terrible when I just think about what are the possibilities if we choose to live in the world as it could be, in spite of the way it is, imagining and being creative and thinking about what are the ways we can unify, what are the ways we can have conversations about race and economics to bring us together to change the way we live in this country. That's it.